So what we're going to do this week and specifically today. So today we're going to finish the theory behind uh, observation, interviews and the others need finding methods we are going to, to see. We are going to, I'm going to talk about four uh, need finding methods, observation we started last week and then there is interviews, surveys and contextual inquiry. Um, that's today. So today we are going to through all these four methods. Tomorrow we are going to do an exercise for the entire hour and a half about interview. So how to prepare for conducting an interview and selecting users for your interview, etc. We clearly cannot do an exercise on observation. Um, we sort of did with the video uh, last time with the Alexa and that uh, lady that uh, inspired the name of a group, I think also, yeah. Uh, so it was useful for, <laughs> for at least one thing. And, and then tomorrow we are going to, we're also going to, to talk about uh, the assignment number one. So we are going to read together the text and the things you will uh, need to do for the next two weeks in the lab. Hmm? Labs that will start on Wednesday. Um, and that's already online and you have seen the main things you have to do is an interview. So that's why we also do an exercise on interviews um, tomorrow. And as an additional point, it's a try to do an observation, a small observation or a contextual inquiry, and then process those information in some way and there are example in the text on how to do uh, things. Um, so this is the plan for this week. So still about need finding. So last time we stopped speaking about observation. We actually started speaking uh, of observation uh, in Wednesday. And um, so we said that one of the goal of observation is actually learn the activities, learn the processes versus the practice. And there could be some risk like misinterpreting what you're saying, what you're um, seeing. And you can also disrupt normal practice because you are one additional element in the context. And you can also overlook, especially if you're not particularly expert in observation, some important information. Maybe you focus on the small details and not more important information. So these are three risks to keep in mind. Uh, but observation is clearly useful for, again, understanding the difference between processes, what a person is expected to do, versus practice, that is what a, the person actually do to reach that goal to do that process. And also you can understand other type of context, like the time of the day. Is this activity done in the morning different than the same activity in the evening uh, in the context in which this, this person is, and especially is useful for unspoken tacit knowledge. Things that people do on habit or automatically or like a trick to do things quicker, etc. And all this um, information, tacit knowledge, is actually golden for, for a person to do an observation because that is the real difference between the process in general, in theory, and which are the actual struggle and point of success and point of failure in the observation. And last time we said that there are two types of observation. One is controlled observation and one, another one is natural observation. So the controlled observation is done within a lab environment, which means you want to observe something, but you don't go where this something happens. You ask people to come here and recreate the activity, the things that they are doing, and you're observing the recreation of the thing. Hmm? So clearly this is easy to reproduce and easy to analyze because it's a controlled environment. You control everything in that environment. So the material you give to the person. If you are recording, and where is the camera, if it's video recording, etc. So it's easy to reproduce. You pick one person, you, you ask this person to come here to do whatever activity, like, let's use one example you know 
and we use last time, like booking an exam. Mm? You ask a person now, outside of the exam period, to come here, log in as a fake user on the portale, and try to register for an exam. Mm? So that's controlled. You ask one, two, three, eleven, one hundred people to come one at a time and do the same observation with multiple people. Easy to reproduce. You have the computer here, everything is set up. Is easy to analyze because clearly you have everything set up, and especially for quantitative data, is quick because you again have everything uh, set up, and so you can proceed quickly. One person come, do the activity, and go. Another person, etc. And uh, there is in the controlled observation specifically a little bit also in the in the naturalistic, the Ultron effect, that is that the act of observation of how someone does something can change their approach on what they're doing. Mm? Imagine that you do something and there is someone that is looking behind your shoulder what you're doing. Maybe you are not so confident or so happy to do everything you typically do and you will change some practice for whatever reason, not to embarrass yourself or you pay more attention, not to make errors, etc. So this is this is the name and is the Otron effect specifically. Hmm? And it's something you have to consider if you observe and you should try to minimize if you observe, like you don't stay on the shoulder of a person specifically, so close, try to keep some distance. So some uh, or try to make the person uh, comfortable in the environment. And it's controlled observation, but still is you are observing some activities. And there is the naturalistic observation that is less structured, in which instead of asking the person to come to your place, you go to their place. So this is um, more reliable, because you go where actions typically happen. It's not in a room you set up, it's in the actual context, in the actual time of the day. So you collect more information, also qualitatively, and it's also more useful for ideation because you see many other people interacting with this person while observing, so it's a richer experience. Uh, and it has some difficulties as well, like it's difficult to include a representative sample because you need to go there you need to wait so if we need to do a naturalistic observation for students enrolling to a specific exam we'll need to wait for the exam period to open mm? so that would be a naturalistic and then we need to go home to these people and then we need to go wherever they are mm? so clearly it's more reliable it's more useful for ideation because you don't call a student here in this computer or in a fake account in a random moment of the day, but you go there where they are setting up, maybe there is other people, maybe there are problems, maybe they are studying and they were forgetting to book for the exam, etc. So the context is richer. And you, of course, learn more in a naturalistic observation, but it's more difficult for, for this other reason. So it's more difficult to include a representative sample, it's more difficult to make them replicable, because Again, one student at home has a certain uh, amount of technology and you can bring something with you, but maybe not the same things that you can have in a structured, controlled environment. And if the person is instead booking the exam on, on the street, you need to follow them, maybe it's raining. So there is clearly more difficulties uh, in the setting and to make it replicable. And of course, similarly, it's hard to manipulate what's called external variable. Mm? So if it's raining when you observe a user working on a smartphone, that behavior is likely different to the same person doing the same activity when it's sunny. Because there is no umbrella, because maybe the person is calm and doesn't want to uh, maybe more, more, more. Uh, slow down things because I don't want to um, to get the rain, etc. And, and of course, is you cannot manipulate external variable. You cannot manipulate rain. Mm? Rain is a certain variable. You you pick the weather that there is at that moment when you do the observation. And the best you can do is to wait for the raining to stop. Uh, but then that person is still doing that activities the day after. 
Maybe yes, maybe not. It depends on the objectivity. So both control and naturalistic have their pros and cons. The controlled is easier to replicate, etc., but you get less information from them. The naturalistic is more reliable. You get much more information. It's much more time consuming for you. And it's a little bit more difficult to replicate. And it's ob obviously harder to replicate external variable. Hmm? Uh, so in general, when it's possible, uh, the naturalistic observation is to be preferred, keeping in mind these uh, difficulties and, and assessing these difficulties. Like, OK, it's difficult to make it exactly the same for everybody. It's fine, but let's try to make it as similar as possible, for instance. And let's try to find a moment in which it's not raining if we need to, to go out. Or let's try to do all the observation while it's raining. And we or half the observation while it's raining and half when, when it's not, so that we can have two different groups to, to look at. Mm -hmm. So the naturalistic is richer information. When it's not possible, because maybe you need to wait six months to get that, or the activity is in the past, then the controlled the recreation of the activity is uh, a good uh, replacement, something you can, of course, consider. Mm? So this is also true for assignment one, in which, again, we ask you to do some small observation. If you can do in naturalistic settings, wonderful. If you cannot, maybe you can try to recreate that things with the person that is doing the, the activity you want to observe. Uh, and then there are two ways to conduct an observation. One is, well, not two ways, two extremes. Uh, one is the complete observer, like becoming part of the wall. That is similar to what we did with the video. We cannot interact with the people in the video, so we were complete observer. We just were watching. Hmm? So we, in this case, a complete observer, avoid modifying anything, so not even video recording, because adding video recording to the situation is adding something that is different from the normal behavior. Hmm? Or interruption, don't ask for any question, don't ask for anything. And so this is the complete observer. And if you go with this extreme of complete observer that is becoming part of the wall, hmm, metaphorically, uh, of course you, can, you need to schedule time for discussing your observation. You observe something for half an hour, and then after that half an hour is over, you need to talk with these people to maybe have clarification. You will take a lot of notes. In this case, because you are not video recording, you are not audio recording, you are trying to be invisible in a way. The other extreme is the complete participant. Become one of them, like a spy. Mm? So you do exactly the same process, the same activity they are doing. Mm? So you, if there is a training process, you undergo the training. You get all the information, the official information. You, uh, if there is a coffee break, you do the coffee break with these people. You exactly become one of them. Mm? And in this case, this is again richer than the blending uh, because you observe all the practices, because you do exactly what the person is doing, like a trainee. Mm? So you're learning how to do that job, that activity. And you can also validate your observation with the others. The counterpart of this is, of course, again, the, um, the Artron effect. Because you are changing significantly the normal operation. Because you are talking with people that you are not expecting to, and you are asking questions. Because you are learning, you are training, you are training as one of them. Hmm? So these are uh, the two, let's say, extreme. Uh, again, with each of them with pros and cons and things to consider and keep uh, in mind. Hmm? So the complete observer will need time after for discussing. The complete participant needs not to exaggerate too much with interaction, otherwise it remove some information from uh, the context or the person that you are observing is, will try not to like to be kinder than usual, also with colleagues, because you are there, you are um, a guest there, and so there is some human social relationship that is, is going on. 
Mm. So both of them are valid and both of them have their pros and cons. Again, something to consider and keep in mind. Mm. So observations start from the ethnographic observation. I don't remember if I told you the other, the other day. And um, that was, a, this is a practice that ethnography, um, in eth ethnography, where people like go and spend three weeks with, um, in, in the middle of a forest in South America to observe indigenous population with limited contact with technology, for instance. So they observe their practices without technology, without 21st century um, mentality, context, uh, economy, etc. cetera. Mm? So in this case, they will be complete participant for something and observer for others because you are spending all the day, all the nights for weeks with, this with these people. So you, you will cover, in some cases, one or the other practice. In our case, we can choose what we prefer, and we can also choose something in the middle, like a, an observer, but that video record something, and maybe interrupt the process in some case, or so something in the middle between a participant, a partial participant and partial observer, hmm? depending on the situation, again. Mm. So if we are thinking about students enrolling for an exam, is one context. If we are speaking about observing nurses in hospital, is a totally different context. And in some cases you can choose, in some other cases you can just get what you can. So if you are going in an hospital, following, observing doctors, it's difficult that you will be a complete participant. Because they are not going to, to do the medicine things to you. You are just there observing, and in some cases maybe also out of the room if there is a patient. So you will be, in some cases, a little bit participant, in other cases, a totally complete observer. So it depends also on the case you are going to observe and analyze. But the key point is observing and keeping in mind the different uh, kind of observation you can do and advantages and disadvantages of your action. Uh, so. In, in all this case, you can have two categories of that data that you can collect. You can collect both subjective and objective data. Uh, subjective data are impression, ranking, rating by other users on different questions you may ask. Uh, written summary report you can produce or you can ask someone to produce. And artifacts and hints in the workplace. So you notice that there is a process and maybe you notice that the practice is different from that process and there are some hints, some workaround in that practice with respect to the normal process to maybe reduce time or shortcut, maybe skipping some steps or doing things in a slightly different way to reach the same goal. Hmm? This is pretty common in uh, uh, like system like the public administration. When there is a process well scheduled and a user interface that probably was developed 50 years ago and people learned how to use it and how to simplify their work or to avoid errors in that. And these are all subjective impressions, subjective data. And then you can have the more objective, like the anecdotes, like the incident, incident the errors that you observe, the workaround that you observe, the specific things that are quantified in a way. Mm. So observation will allow you to get both of these. And this is about observation. So the core observation is observing people doing activities or redoing activities in case of controlled um, observation with some different degree of your participation uh, that could be complete, partial, or not at all, just observing. But in observation, you typically spend much of the time observing and quiet. And maybe sometimes you ask some question to clarify something that happens, but it's more a clarification of the situation. And then you collect data, for instance, with audio recording or video recording. And then after a home, you process all this video recording, this audio recording, and correlate with your notes, with the time of the day, with the context, with what happened for multiple participants. Interviewing is what you can imagine is asking people questions. So there is no observation involved. It is like an interview you can see in TV or something like that. And 
And there are many forms of interviews. There are one-to-one, -one, say, in-person interviews, and there are surveys that are questionnaires. So in-person interviews have one characteristics, that they are time demanding and will gi give you, if properly done, in-depth knowledge. Because you have, let's say, one person in front of you and you can ask questions. And you can ask follow-up questions to your question. You can go deep as you want, but you don't observe anything. Uh, interviews can be uh, structured one way or the other extreme, unstructured, and then there is also the semi-structured. What means a structured interview? A structured interview is an interview in which you have, let's say, 10 questions, and you just do those 10 questions to everybody. There is no flexibility to add any question, any follow-up question, etc. So you prepared, let's say, 10 questions, you just go with that, with those 10 questions, and that's it. When you reach the 10 questions, you leave. The unstructured interview, as you can imagine, is the totally opposite. You don't prepare any question, you just prepare some topics you want to discuss, and you go there and ask questions as they arise. You want to talk more or less about something, maybe you have an idea of some first questions you can ask, but then everything else is free during the interview. And something that is in the middle, and it's something we are asking you for assignment one, is actually a semi-structured interview. A semi-structured interview is an interview in which you prepared, let's say, 10 questions, and you will ask everybody those 10 questions, but if during the interview something happens, or the person says something interesting, you are free to adopt the unstructured part, so ask more questions, even if they are not prepared, even if they are uh, not the same for every people you interview. Hmm? This will allow you to give a more knowledge that is in-depth with respect to the structured interview that you have to imagine all the possibilities or the unstructured where you can just free hmm, to ask everything and everybody could be different from the other one. And then there are two kinds of interviews. One is the one-to-one -one interview, the classical interviews. You get one person at a time, you interview this, or the focus group. The focus group is essentially a group interview hmm? where you are interviewing five people, six people at the same moment hmm? uh, with no difference in the way in which the interview is structured or not, but the difference is how you manage the group of people because in one one interview, there is you and the person, and that's it. In a group interview, you can have some people that speak more and people that speak less, and you don't want to hear from always the same three people. You want to hear from everybody. So it's the uh, person that does the interview that calibrates better the kind who is speaking, who you want to listen in a kinder, in a kind way. Uh, we are not going to talk too much about focus group. We are going to focus on one-to-one -one interviews. And then there are surveys that are just questions, structured questions, uh, that is fast with respect to interviews. It's more superficial because it's totally structured. You can imagine questions. Questions are simple than in-person interviews in surveys. And you have, most of the time, predefined possible answers for every question, so there is not much flexibility for people to, to talk. And this could be paper-based or online, like questionnaire online. So for interviews, one thing to keep in mind, as, as we said last time, is that people typically don't know what they want. Uh, maybe they would know it, again, subconsciously. We, we covered this already last time but not rationally, um, they will tell you sometime, or most of the time, what they think you will like to hear. Mm? Especially if you bring them a new product or a disruptive technology, or you say, this is my application, let's talk about it. They will try to be nice with you because it's your application. About 
The what? The in-person interview. Yes. Mm -hmm. But if you have zero knowledge, like uh, you already know what the, you need to ask. Uh, is it because the, you already know what the issues are? No. Uh, no, you are not going exactly. We will see example of good and bad questions in a while, because it depends what you ask, of course. So if you're going to ask, do you like this feature? That's the terrible question to ask, by the way. And we will see that. Uh, and then in that case, you already know what to ask exactly. In an interview, we want in-depth knowledge, similarly to observation, in-depth knowledge of their perspective, their practices, what they are doing now, to see if there is any gaps, to see, in this case of need finding, uh, any gaps, any problem, any issue that you, as designer, creator, developer, engineer, can imagine a solution to fix it. Okay, you are looking at what is working, what is not working in a specific domain that you want to investigate. Okay, we will see a list of good and bad questions, by the way. Um, so again, this is about users. We talked about this last week. People typically lack their creativity. So in the end, you are the one that needs to get information and create something. You are the creativity. You are the creative here. You are the developer. You are the engineer. So you are the one that should come up with solutions. They can come up with solutions, but it's not, maybe it's a good idea, or maybe it's a terrible idea. It is up to you to understand that and to go deep a little bit. It's like the example with the horses, right? I want a faster horse is a solution, but the need behind that was totally different. What the horses was one possible solution, but not uh, historically the best or the adopted solution that they had. Hmm? And, and people take the current cost context as granted. Uh, think what, about what we said about assumptions last time. You bring assumption on the table, but they also bring their own assumption on the table. So you need to, to consider that and, um, and consider something is granted for them, and maybe you need to ask. Maybe a question that looks like stupid question, but to just go deeper in their, um, in their practice and their ideas. Mm -hmm. uh, again, we are talking about need finding. So we are talking about interview on a specific domain. I want to interview students to understand uh, how they uh, live in Politecnico during exam period. Mm -hmm. So you are just asking questions to them to understand those things. Um, so it's essential to, of course, choosing participants for interviews. Of course, you need representative of your target users involving all stakeholders. So if you are uh, talking about students during exam period, you will, of course, interview students, but maybe you will also interview some professors because they are involved in the exam. And you will also probably try to talk with some secretarian because they are involved in the process of exams. Hmm? Um, so all stakeholders, representative. Uh, of course, you will speak more with students because they are the primary users for you. But the other opinions, idea, perspective could be valuable. Uh, if you don't have Polytechnic students for whatever, well, you can pick students from the University of Turin. You can pick students from University of Pisa or whatever, other university. So similar system in a way. They will not be exactly the same as here, but it's a good approximation if you don't have. Um, and sometimes, not in this course, not for the activity you do, but in general, interviews have some incentives, motivations, small gift. You go here, spend half an hour with me talking an interview, I will give you uh, this one. Well, not this one, something like this. Or a cup, or five euro in a 
Amazon gift card or a coffee or something like that. So small incentives or could be motivations. So help me because there is this important motivation for me. And next time maybe I will help you because you have a similar motivation, similar goal. So typically there is always some incentives, motivation for participating in an interview or because you are friends. So that's another motivation. So how do you execute the interview? Uh, you first of all schedule on time and place that is comfortable for the people you want to interview and it's okay for you. Then you introduce yourself. We said some of this thing uh, the other week. You introduce yourself and explain your purpose. I'm here because I'm investigating the university life during exam period. Hmm? Uh, you are not testing them. It's not an exam. There is no right or wrong answer. You are just, you want to understand more of their perspective. Hmm? So they are helping you. It's not that you are interrogating them, okay? And this is, will be true also for when we talk about usability testing, in which they are helping you to refine the system or the prototype you will develop. Uh, interviews should begin with open-ended, unbiased, non-leading question. Hmm? So open question, general question should start. And then as the interview continue, you narrow down the kind of question you ask. And from open-ended, various big questions, you move to more specific questions. Hmm? Um, in a way similar, I don't know if I have a slide or remove it. I remove it in a way similar to a story. Hmm? You start with once upon a time, you set the context, and then in the end, uh, there is, in the very, very end, there is, and they all, after all of these, lived happily uh, hmm? or not. But you have an open, wide um, questions that open the context and explain what you are doing, what you are talking about, and why they are there. And then you end up with specific action that happens during the story as the story evolved, and you go focus on some actions, some people, some processes, etc. So this is the beginning and that's the start. Um, in interview, it's important to give people time to reply. And if they want to reply twice to the same question, it's fine. Uh, most of the time, the second reply is more interesting than the first one. Maybe the first one is immediate, and then at a certain point, you say, well, let me think about this. In reality, this could be different, etc." And since we imagine a, a semi-structure interview, uh, follow up with related question and deep dive into interesting point. You ask us, us a question that you planned, and there is something interesting coming up from the, que the answer, then ask again something, go deeper in that answer, if you feel that is something that can be expanded or explained more. Hmm? Um, so the, the critical part in an interview is questions, creating those questions well. Hmm? So in general, structured questions are easier to process, uh, like tell me three things that you like about this. This is structured, hmm? so questions, not interviews, because they have three things to say, and exactly three, instead of tell, tell me how your day is going. That's open-ended, unstructured question. So the structured question is easier to process. Tell me, tell me three things you like about Polytechnico. Three things you like about Polytechnico? You have to pick three things you like about Polytechnico, I'm sorry. Or not, but. Someone? One thing you like about Polytechnico? The toilet. The toilet. <laughs> so it's easier to process. You have one goal and one answer, three answer. Uh, instead, how, tell me how your days went. And then you, you need to decide where I start from, like breakfast or maybe my day here, etc. So the structured one is easier to process, the other are more difficult, but unstructured questions solicit more comments because you will 
see the entire day of this person unfolding, for instance. Um, so again, open-ended question with follow-up discussion. For quantitative question, you can ask rate in a scale from one to five, where one is extremely bad and five is extremely well. Uh, and if they say four, they say, okay, what do you mean four? Because five is extremely well, so four is well. What do you mean for well? Hmm? And, and aim at direct, concrete, specific question that ask for the tile answer and use, for, use the language of the people. So if you're talking about with primary school student, children, try to talk their language and not the university language. Hmm? Uh, when you do questions, and this is even more true for surveys, always try the interview with a smaller, trusted gr group of friends for like debugging. So if I prepare 10 questions and I will ask him 10 questions, even if he's not in the target population and he's not able to understand what I mean for question number two, then maybe I will need to refine that question before going and interviewing 10 people that are in my target population. So do some, get some friends, uh, some people that live with you maybe, and ask them those questions to see if they work or they're not understandable. Just for a cycle of debugging. Um, so examples, positive or negative. These are all examples of open-ended question. Tell me about your typical day as a nurse, as a student. Hmm? Tell me three good things about Politecnico and three bad things about Politecnico. And always start with the positive things. If you need to ask positive and negative things, always ask both and always ask the positive first because we are, we are very, very good in complaining and highlighting bad things. Uh, and so if we start with the bad things, it will not be three, it will be like 100. So start with the positive things so that they, they really need to think about the positive things like the toilet for him. Um, and then move to the bad things. There could be three, there could be four, there could be two. It's better not to have one, hmm? multiple things. Uh, if you're talking about an application that exists, what has gone wrong with the application recently, or this week, or this month, and how do you cope? That's the second question, right? Follow-up question. It's defined, but it's a follow-up question. Uh, and then you can also end the interview, if you want, with questions like, what else should we have asked you about? Did we forget to cover some topic in my introduction? Hmm? So these are good example of open-ended question that except the last one could also be used at the beginning of interviews. And then the more the interview proceeds, you go deep and narrow down your questions. Um, so bad questions to avoid. Is feature X important to you? This is a leading question. Why do you think it is a leading question? Oh. That's another problem that is related to this question. But so avoid the yes/no answer is one of the other points, I think. Um, but it's not leading; it's yes/no questions. Why it's leading? What are you leading here? You are implying that the feature is somewhat important. Is this activity, even if it's not a feature, is this activity important for you? You are implying that there is some, something special about that activity. So instead of asking which are the activity you're doing, so let's not talk about features. So let's imagine we're talking about activities that you do in a day. Instead of asking, is the activity A important for you, which you pick up an activity that you imagined was important or not, and ask them, you should ask, give me, tell me which are the three top most important activities you do in your day. And then you can go deep in each of them if you want, or you can pick one of them. Mm -hmm. So avoid leading questions 
and avoid the yes no questions also this is why you should avoid the yes no questions what's the goal of an interview to discover something, to get knowledge, to get in-depth knowledge. So if you ask a yes-no question, how deep is the knowledge you get? How deep is the knowledge you get with a yes or a no? Not superficial, it's not deep. So if you want to give deep knowledge, avoid the yes-no question and ask what you want to know after the yes or no directly. Okay? And this is another bullet point here. Um, what would you like in a tool? What would you like to do? What would you like imagination? These are uh, bad questions, especially for novices, um, because they are expert in their own domain, their experience, not expert in design, development, etc. So this is a question you should skip hmm, in a normal interview. Don't ask them what they want. Try to extract them. It's your job to understand what they want, what they need. Mm. Uh, what do you like in X? This is an assuming question similar to the leading question. You are assuming that that thing is something that you, they like. What do you like in uh, the Portale di della Didattica? Maybe you didn't like anything. So why you should reply me something? Mm. Um, Maybe you don't like, but maybe you love something, so it's much more. Or maybe you tolerate something. Hmm? And so you can ask again, as before, um, which are three positive things that you find in. And then again, you can go deep from there. Uh, again, what would you do in an hypothetical situation? Again, avoid this. This will be just most of the time random for you because people cannot really imagine the complete environment you are referring to. They will go there with their assumption and the knowledge that is not the knowledge and the assumption you are making. Uh, how often you do X? We are very, very bad at estimating things. Um, so if you have something to collect this timing, then it's better to use that something you collect. Mm? Uh, if I ask you how many time you spend Get, tell me um, an application that you use. Instagram. How many time you spent yesterday on Instagram without checking? One hour. one hour. Then if you check, you will discover that that one hour is not exactly one hour. It will be low, less or more. And we are terrible in estimating this thing. You can do this experiment. Think yesterday or this week how many hours I spent on my favorite application then check on your phone Instagram has these statistics inside for instance and you check how far you are from that number it is rare that there is exactly um, zero as a difference maybe small maybe large it depends from the day so we are bad at estimating things as human beings mm -hmm. um, so if you want timing if you want times so of uh, things that occur Again, instead of asking how much time you spent on Instagram, you can ask, show me, can we see how much time you show on Instagram yesterday? And so the person can pick up the phone and see how much time they spent. So the real data instead of the perceived data. Um, binary question, yes, no. They do not heal the motivation. They are not deep. Uh, tell me a story about you. Why tell me a story about you? is not a good question. Well, it's not a question, but can you please tell me a story about you? That's a question. Why this is a bad question? Maybe the story can be totally unrelated to the Maybe the story could be totally unrelated. It could be, it's, it's, too, it's, too, it's too wide. Mm? Tell me a story about you. What, like what they did yesterday for, what they had today for breakfast is a story, or I need to imagine a nice story with my cat, or I need a story from my childhood. 
which kind of story. So we'll pick up something and everybody, you're going to do the interviews with multiple people. So everybody will pick up their own story that could be different from another one. Hmm? Tell me something about you is the same thing. Um, how do you reach the decision? Did you meet? Did someone decide it without you, etc.? are bad questions because you are suggesting answers. You are suggesting that they meet. You are suggesting that someone decided without them. And if you don't know if they reach a decision, you are suggesting that they reach a decision. Hmm? So avoid in an answer providing, in a question to provide answer. Uh, and notice how many surveys actually do this, and they do it wrongly. Hmm? Don't suggest answer in the questions. Ask what you want to do, and then trust the response, and then again, follow up on that, if you want. Okay, so these are a list of bad questions, categories of bad questions. Uh, tomorrow, as we were saying, we will create, um, start to create some questions, so keeping in mind this bad and good example of question we, we have seen. Uh, and then you will do it, you will need to do it the same for your domain, your uh, team. Um, but again, the critical part about the interviews is getting the questions right and give time to other people to, to reply to those questions. Uh, survey, survey, very, very quickly survey. In, re in reality, I are here for, because there are a couple of examples, a couple of things that apply also to, to interviews that could be useful. Surveys are interviews uh, generalized and put online or on paper to reach a more statistical, um, significant number of participants. So while interviews, you can interview 10 students, let's say a survey could be done for all students. So you potentially reach all the students of the university and get information from them. Uh, survey are good for a shallow view, so not in-depth. Interviews allow you, especially semi-structured, allow you to get in-depth knowledge. Survey will not get in-depth knowledge unless you do hundreds of questions and then people will stop answering the survey because it's too long. Uh, it's impossible to ask follow-up questions and most of the free text answer are not really replied and you should avoid them in, uh, um, uh, in surveys. Um, well, the structure is similar to the one of interviews. You declare the purpose of the survey and expected time. You have one more section uh, with questions and then in the end or at the beginning, you can have background information about the user if you need to say, okay, how old this, this person is, which is his job, etc. Things that you can also know from an interview or you can use this information to, um, to get the people you, you want for the interviews. Here there is some example, um, but in survey you have a little of an open-ended question and a lot of closed-ended question with one possible choice uh, in some scale nominal, ordinal, etc. You should all know these things from maths uh, and statistics. If you don't know here, there is a, a summary, like you don't compute average on nominal data or ordinal data, but you at least need interval scale to do an average. And other statistics only apply to higher level scale. Uh, but one ordinal scale, that you calculate means um, in practice is Likert scale. And this is also something you can use in the usability testing in the end of the course and in the interviews. Uh, Likert scale is a specific scale uh, for asking for the level, level of agreement about a statement. Mm? So you do a statement and say how much do you agree from a scale to one to five, or one to seven, or one to nine. Um, where extreme values are very rare to be selected, one, terrible, five, perfect. And um, in some cases, you, if you don't want a neutral response, because in a scale from one to five, you have one that is very, very bad, two that is bad, three that is neutral, 
four that is good, and five that is very good. In some cases, you want people not, so most of the cases you use a uh, scale like one to five, one to seven, one to nine. In other cases, you don't want a neutral answer. You want people to take a stance. It's bad or good? Is positive or negative? Is appropriate or not? So in those cases, you remove the middle answer. And so instead of having a scale from one to five, you have a scale from one to four, in which one is very bad, two is bad, three, three is good, and five and four is very good. So it depends if you want a neutral response or not. In most cases, you accept a neutral answer. Um, and this bad, good, etc., is typically defined as five, sorry, one, strongly disagree with the statement, one, disagree with the statement, three, neutral, neither agree or disagree, four, agree, and five, strongly agree. And in most cases, you just label or tell to people the meaning of one and five. So tell me on a scale to one to five, where one is strongly disagree and five is strongly agree, what do you think about this thing? And then people will say one, and you will ask because, why, etc. So this is a kind of scale that we will find also at the end of the course, and you can use it also for interviews. So we, we spend these moments here on this. Uh, and this is also true, this is Im extremely important for survey, but it's also true for interviews. So if possible, use, use simple questions. And if you really need to do a complex question, just divide it. Use two simple questions instead of one difficult question. Because if you ask one question, even talking, even in an interview, you are asking multiple things and the person needs to remember all these things and reply and correlate, etc. And maybe it's doing some correlation that is not needed and you don't want. So instead of asking these and that and that other thing, you just ask, what about this? Answer. And what about that? Answer. And you split the question in simpler questions. This, this is mandatory in a survey, but it's also helpful in an interview. Uh, Avoid negative words in questions. Avoid strange structures like I don't do this and not these other things and neither this. Or use not with a verb that is negative and then one person is thinking, okay, this is double negation, so it's positive or not. Avoid this. The less, the easier, the better. Uh, and biased questions solici solicit biased answers exactly as we said for interviews, like leading questions and too vague questions or um, questions that try to give the answer. Mm -hmm. So this is the same that will apply for surveys. Finally, contextual inquiry. So contextual inquiry is in the end because it's not a new method. So while observation is observation that is totally different from interview, that is sort of similar to survey, contextual inquiry is a more recent method than observation and interview, and put together observation with interviewing. Hmm? So we said you can observe, and then after the observation you can interview, or you can interview and skip the observation. Contextual inquiry is observing while interviewing. <coughs> So you observe the person, and in the meantime, you also interview them. Um, that's why in the assignment one, we ask you to do an observation, a small observation, or a contextual inquiry. Because either you do interview and a small observation, or you do a contextual inquiry that put together observation and interview. And the key point is that you want to observe something, not just ask. Uh, because you learn, as we said before and the other time, you learn much more observing than asking. Hmm? So contextual inquiry uh, stands for inquiry of context. And what is the context? The context is the research 
take place in the user natural environment, so it's a sort of a naturalistic observation, as they conduct their activities uh, they, as they normally do. So it's an observation hmm, in the context. It's an inquiry because the researcher, the, the, per the person, watches the user as they perform their activities according to the domain, to the activities you are observing, and ask for information to understand how and why they did what they did in that moment. Hmm? So different from observation and interview, in which first you observe, and then in the end, after the observation, if you're not a complete participant, you ask, do you remember you did this five minutes ago, 10 minutes ago, can you tell me why? And a person needs to remember. Here, you interview while observing or observing while interviews. So something happened, you can say, wait a moment, why? Why are you doing this? Because this is different from before, etc. So you ask immediately something. Hmm? So participants are observed while they perform their activity and talk what ab what about what they are doing while they perform them. Hmm? So it's again an observation we mixed with interviews. And different from observation followed by interviews or vice versa, here participants take a more active role in leading their session. Because they are trying in a way, like a craftsman with an apprentice, they're trying to, in a way it's like they are trying to teach you, to train you to do the same job, hmm? to do the same activity. So I'm now opening this and logging here and you see now I don't click here but I click there even if instructions say click the button on the left because the button on the left will need will bring you to the same um, page we are looking for but in 11 steps instead if we go this way and we use the search it will be shorter but you need to, sh to search for this thing hmm? so you observing and this person is also narrating trying to tell you why they are doing the things they are doing in that specific way with some reason, with some motivation. Hmm? So they take a more active role, again, like a craftsman with an apprentice. You are the apprentice and they are the craftsman. Uh, so, and then things are either similar to the interview or similar to observation. You observe, it's an activity, you can ask questions and there is the same bad questions that you have in the interview to avoid and the good question and you can start a contextual inquiry with some open-ended question like an interview etc so it's really a mix of the two things with the thing that we have seen uh, just today that apply that still apply so which is the difference between a contextual inquiry and an interview so which is an a disadvantage of interview in some cases so interviews rely on the people's ability to recall and explain a process that they are not doing in that moment. So if I'm interviewing you on your usage of the portal, let's say, you will need to remember what you did the last time you used that specific process. So you need to recall from memory and explain but maybe last time you were in a hurry or maybe you were comfortably seated at home and it's different from the context. Um, so if I'm asking you that thing, you will probably attempt to summarize the process. Oh, well, I do this and do that. Uh, and some important details, reasoning, motivation, the underlying mental model in that moment are left out from the summary. In a way, it's similar to what last week I asked you, tell me how do you book for an exam, and many of you will just skip to the login phase, the turning on the computer, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. That was an assumption, because it was a summary. Hmm? So similarly, you can have this risk in interview, that people just skip some steps because they feel they are not important. Hmm? But maybe they are hmm? for you, and so you need to to get a more precise summary as possible. And this is possible most of the time only observing them doing the thing. Um, and so that could be a superficial understanding uh, of user approaching the, uh, the entity. Uh, 
most of the time, people can easily talk about what they are doing and why, while they are doing. Mm? You imagine you should have a problem to explain to me how do you check the statistics for Instagram use while you're doing because you are doing that in that moment so you are fresh in your memory you are actually doing that moment step by step and this could include oops i did something wrong this is the wrong page i need to go back and that is again important for you because if you're looking for gaps and issues the fact that 10 people using a certain thing making the same error means something for sure because everybody that that this do the uh, did that error so you get to see the interruption, any superstitious behavior, depends in the context, and also logical process. Like I do this, again, if you look at people using some complex software, you will say, I do this because the one before me told me to do that. And you can say, but there is an easier way. They added it, an easier process, and they didn't know because they always do that way because someone tell them to do this in the past, and they followed them. So you will discover something or some absence of a communication, for instance. Uh, versus observation instead. Contextual inquiry works well for understanding in-depth thought process of users. Similar in a way to, um, more similar to interviews if you ask the right questions. Um, observation instead works well better when the activity does not require in-depth thoughts. So if you are tasked to understand how an e-commerce work, because you want to recreate it, that's not really nowadays in-depth thoughts. It's pretty standard. You don't want to innovate. You just want to replicate a cart, a shopping bag, and the process to check out and pay. Mm. So you can observe. But you don't really need people maybe to tell you, oh, I log in on Amazon and then I click on add to the cart and then I go to the cart and press checkout. There is, is a pretty standard behavior nowadays. Mm. Um, or when people cannot or should not be interrupted or distracted in the activity. Again, think of a doctor in an hospital. It's not that they are surgically working and they say, so tell me why you're doing this. This is, of course, not something that you can do. You can observe from a distance and see what's going on, but not also wait a moment, go back. Hmm? You, you cannot do that. Hmm? So in this case, an observation followed by an interviews is a valid option. Hmm? So contextual inquiry has its own advantages and disadvantages, and different from observation in interviews needs to be done in a slightly more careful way because uh, participants will try to go into interview modes. So they will stop doing and we just start talking. Mm. So it's your job um, to, to make them also do the activity instead of just telling, uh, listening to their activity. Mm. So they will tend to stop doing and telling, oh, now I click here, or now I do this, or now I did that in that moment, instead of showing you. Um, and it can be easy for participant to summarize the process at the end. Like, I show you everything. So now remember, I did this before and then I did that. Um, it, contextual inquiry, in a way, if you, if you have ever experienced learning how to cook a recipe from uh, an older person than you, that is sort of contextual inquiry in which this person is telling you okay now chop this thing and then the the water should be there and you need also a pan here and you need butter but it's not from the fridge from um, outside mm -hmm. so temperature of the room etc so it's it's doing and you will do in that case and also you you can ask questions let's say, why you do this and how many grams of these things you need? And the answer would be, well, I don't know. I just put two ends of this, and that's it. Uh, and so maybe you ask, can we weigh them? So that, because my ends are not similar to yours. And you can have more information. Hmm? So it's, um, some, in some cases, 
So that could be similar to the contextual inquiry in general. Uh, it's a show and tell. Sometimes it could be a show and tell of frustration with the current solution. Again, if we work on an application, on a solution, let's imagine the Portale della Didattica. I imagine that we do a contextual inquiry in the Portale della Didattica. You will have, you will point out uh, things that don't work. Even if they are not strictly related to the process or the thing I'm asking you. Uh, because like, oh, this could be done differently. Or well, can I give you this feedback about this part? Mm? So this is true, especially if there is a project, uh, uh, an application, something that already exists and you are exploring. Uh, but this is not the, pro the purpose of contextual inquiry. That is a good feedback session for a developer that needs to fix bugs, maybe. But the purpose of contextual inquiry is to understand people's thoughts and work process regardless of the specific implementation of the project, of the application that they have in front. Mm? So bugs are not really relevant, and feedback on I don't like the color either. So if you do a contextual inquiry, you should try to make the participant not going into interview mode. And if the participant is talking and not doing, you should say, OK, but now can you show me? Interrupt this modality. and. You can listen for some feedback, don't get note of that, and ask the person to proceed on the process that you are interested in it. Uh, you introduce biases, as in any time you interact in a reality. So it's important to approach contextual inquiry objectively without any assumption, without any preconceived notion or opinion about the person, the process, the tool, the system, whatever. Uh, so try to go into activity. That's also applied to interviews and observation. Try to go into the activity with an open mind, treating everything you learn with the same level of importance in that moment. And then after, analyze. After everything is done, analyze if there is something more important or maybe more repeated among multiple contextual inquiry. Uh, and you can bias the user, so try not to. Uh, it's possible that the participant may adjust the process to fit into the discussion or your interpretation. So if something happened, the person says something, and you ask something, maybe one of the bad questions, the person can try to be nice with you and follow you along, giving you reason, giving you, saying you that you are right even if you are not right in that moment, in that opinion. But it will be rude to say you're wrong. And so that is, again, a social aspect of, of this. Mm? So try not to bias the user. Again, good questions. Mm? So these are the, the methods that we, I wanted to, to introduce to you. Again, tomorrow we will do a, um, an exercise on interview, because even here, the most important thing is actually questions that you can ask and how you approach, approach them. So not to bias the people you are talking or not to bring your assumption or your biases in that. Of course, these methods needs to be applied on multiple people. So you don't just interview one person and that's it. You interview 10 people maybe, and you get something from a person, something else from another person. But if all the 10 people will point out the same need the same gap, the same issue, then that probably it's a good starting point to look at. And you cannot look at just individually, but you at a certain point need to analyze on a larger scale, considering the corpus, the entire set of interviews, observation, and contextual inquiry you did. OK? I think that we can stop here for today. Um, we will see tomorrow, and then on Wednesday, there is the, um, the first lab on assignment number one. I'm still here if you have any questions, comments. Otherwise, have a nice evening and night, and see you tomorrow.